What in your being prevents you from understanding this work better? Self-will? Pride? Laziness. Laziness. Our understanding depends on the quality and level of our being. The understanding is the result of knowledge and being. So when knowledge and being are joined, understanding is the result. It's like taking two elements and putting them together and getting a third thing. We, we understand what that's like. We take, for example, flour and water and we put them together and we mix them up and we put them in, the, in an oven. We bake and we get bread. Knowledge and being. You put knowledge and being together and you get understanding. If you see no reason to change your being, then your understanding of everything stays the same. And the truth about us, that is the people on this planet, is we see no reason to change our being. Rarely do we ever see a reason to change. But the truth is, we see no reason to change our being. And so, our understanding about everything stays at the same level. Now, some people are dissatisfied with their state of being, and others are not. More are dissatisfied with the conditions of life. A lot of people think they're dissatisfied with their state of being. What they're really dissatisfied with is the conditions in their life. They just want this to happen or that to happen, and get rid of this or get that, you know, change this around. So it's really a matter of moving things around on the table. In the past, I've talked to you about context and content. Content is like knowledge, and context is, context is like being. The content of your life, that's the stuff on the table. Your being is that which is holding the stuff. So it would be basically the table in this example. Now those who are dissatisfied with the kind of people they are, they're the kind of people that might have or might begin to have some kind of an idea of what it means to change their being, to change what kind of people they are, to become different kinds of people. We all go through little things in life where we realize that we're not going to change the world. We're not going to change the content, content the conditions of life, and that we're unhappy. And we're forced into this corner, then the only thing for us to do is to change ourselves to change the kind of person that we are. If you're the kind of person that other people find it difficult to be around, it puts you, backs you right into a corner. And there are a lot of ways to deal with that. Be at war with all people. Be at war with life. Or one of the other ways to deal with it is to say, you know, maybe these people have a point. The kind of person I am really needs to change. And so then we start talking about changing our being. And that's not easy. It's much easier to go to a hairdresser and change your look. It's much easier to go to a tailor or a dressmaker and change your appearance. It's much easier to go to a makeup artist, go to Merle Norman or, or, or some place and, and have that done. It's much easier to go to a gym. Now we're getting a little more difficult, but it's still much easier to go to a gym and work out every day and get your body in shape than it is to change your being. It's difficult to change your being. Why change your being? If it's so hard, why bother changing it? What, why make all of this effort? Why, just so that other people will like you? No, because they won't, or they will. Growth of being means a deeper understanding of this work. So what? So what? So, so what is a deeper understanding of this work? What does that mean? What is, what, you know, I've read all the books, I know all the stuff, I can repeat it, I can say it, I can tell other people, I can teach it, I know all about it. What is a deeper understanding of the work? This work can unite us with more, it can give us more, it can influence us more, it can become more real for us. What does that mean? What does that mean? This is where we have problem seeing being. We can't really see what that means. What, that, what does that mean that we'll have a deeper, better understanding of the work? If you don't work on being, what happens is this work remains in your memory only. You can remember it sometimes with difficulty. It just kind of pops up. Oh, and you remember it. But it's with difficulty, with making some real effort. And it's still hit and miss. And that can be a problem. At first, it's not a problem. But later, it starts to become a growing problem. Because 
having the work in your memory only and not connected with your being means it has a form, like a form of religion where it, where it lacks the power. There's nothing, there's no power in it. There's no power. It's like having a car with no gas in it. Or a car, beautiful car. You've got a beautiful car in your driveway, but it doesn't have a motor in it, or it doesn't have a drive shift, or it doesn't have a, a transmission, or it doesn't have some component that makes it possible for it to have power to do. Because really, what good is it if it can't do what it's supposed to do? And that's how we are. What good is all this knowledge if we still can't do what it is that this knowledge tells us is possible for us to do? which is change our being, change the kind of people that we are. We've spent our entire lives trying to change the kind of people that we're around or trying to get away from the kind of people that we're around. But we have spent almost no time trying to change the kind of people we are. Why? Well, because we haven't known how. It's a very difficult process. And what's worse is we can't even see what kind of people we are. Other people can, but they're wrong because what we see isn't what they see. What we see is much more generous. Now, some of us like to go the other way and we pretend not to like ourselves. We pretend to think that others think more of us than we think of ourselves. That is a lie. And if you bought that lie, well, I got a bridge I want to sell you in, I don't know, uh, Lake Havasu. Also, it becomes a problem and a worse problem, because the work will finally be swamped by life eyes belonging to your current level of being. And what that looks like is little eyes that are so concerned with anxieties and worries and life and getting this and getting that and doing this and doing that. Pat and I talked about this a little. Actually, Pat talked about it last night and I listened. Her son got poison oak and his face was all swollen and he came and said, Mom, look, it itches. And she said inside of herself, she just went crazy. I've got to fix this. I've got to do something. She went through the mother thing. We all understand that at a different level. Men, women, it doesn't really matter. At some level, we all understand because there's something inside of us that reacts to helplessness or an issue that needs to be dealt with. But it doesn't react in a calm, logical, sensible, measured, balanced manner. It acts like an idiot. Pat was telling me she called her husband and she said, Rex, have you seen James? He says, I don't know where he's at. He says, no, have you seen him? <laughs> he says, just calm down. And she couldn't really calm down, but she heard him. You know, she heard him and thought, yeah, I do need to calm down. You, know, you couldn't do it, but, but she heard it. And you see, this is the way the work speaks to us. You may not be able to do anything at first, but at first you actually begin to hear it without getting angry. Well, calm down. What do you mean, calm down? I'll show you calm. No, 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 no. Just calm down. We go, oh, yeah, calm down. That's right. I need to calm down. See, it's, so it's different. We, 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 we slowly begin to change, very slowly begin to change. But it is possible. It is possible to change the kind of person we are. It is possible to change our being. It's just that it looks impossible because it's so difficult to do, and so few people are doing it. And so few of us have any real knowledge about how to do it, and fewer still actually apply that knowledge. If you're satisfied with yourself, never challenging your wrong feeling of I, the wrong feeling about yourself. You never really challenge that. You never really doubt that. You never really dig into that. You're always pointing the finger at them. You're always accepting, you're always accepting the fact that, well, they, they're, they're, well, them. They, 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 they. You're always accepting that too easily. You, you, you're not suspicious about yourself, about your feeling of self-righteousness. You're not suspicious about your position over other people. You know, there's no suspicion in your mind. You really believe you're better than other people. It's like, oh my God, that's just incredible. But that is where we live. We really do live there. The first thing we suspect is the other person. The last thing we ever suspect is our own feeling of ourselves. So if you're satisfied with yourself, if you're never really challenging this wrong feeling of yourself, life has satisfied you then. You have little desire to change your being, the kind of person you are, because 
You're satisfied. You're going to make it. You're going to make it to the grave. You're going to have enough money. You're going to have enough food. You're going to have enough comfort. You're going to have enough electricity. You're going to have enough TVs. You're going to have enough cars and gas to put in the cars. You're going to have enough in your bank account. You're going to have enough to retire. You're going to have enough to travel. If that's where you're at, then you're dead. That is just fuel for this work. All that stuff that we're satisfied with is just fuel for this work. That goes on the fire. Take all that stuff and start to put it on the fire. All that gets fed through the work. All that needs to shift. All that, it, that the, the signs, remember we talked about the positive and the negative signs of essence and false personality, need to be changed. They need to be switched. It's time for that to change. Great starting place, but it's either do it or leave, get with it, you know, but get after it. It's time. I mean, time's a wasting. The linchpin in this work, and it's very difficult to understand, and why I say it's the linchpin is because this is where the whole thing turns. Either you're deficient or others are deficient. That's it. If your feeling of yourself is they're deficient, you're in trouble. If you're beginning to feel like you're deficient, there may be a hope for you, a hope and a prayer. If you're beginning to suspect that maybe you're deficient, now, it's okay if you've got a huge ego, a lot of pride and vanity, and you can accept that you're deficient as long as you get to believe that other people are deficient too. Okay, you can have your little pacifier to suck on now for a while. But sooner or later, you're going to have to give up your pacifier and your diapers and your rattle, because that's all that stuff is. Those are just little toys and things that we play with until we can learn to walk on our own, until we can learn to do for ourselves, until we can learn to manage ourselves. See, babies stay in cribs and have pacifiers and rattles and diapers because they can't manage themselves. And we have rites of passage in life where people get to manage themselves, where they proved that they can manage themselves. And they proved, like, there's a rite of passage when a child walks. You know, they walk. It's like, yeah! He's walking. Look, he took his first step. Oh, he made three steps. He took six steps. Now he's running around the house. Then there's the rite of passage where they're potty trained. So they get rid of the diapers. They get rid of the baby shoes that are good for nothing. I don't know why they put shoes on babies. They don't walk anywhere. Their feet don't work. Look at their little feet. They look like little club feet. What do you got shoes on? Well, whatever. Get them used to it. I don't know. Maybe it's like putting a collar on a dog. You know? Get them used to it. Anyway. I do digress, but it's fun sometimes. Either we're deficient or others are. To see our level of being, we have to observe ourselves in the light of what the work teaches. This is difficult because we don't want to observe ourselves in the light of what the work teaches. We want to observe ourselves in the light of what we teach. We want to observe ourselves in the light of what we know. We want to observe ourselves in the light of the knowledge that we have gathered on our own. We don't want this other outside influence interfering with our efforts about ourselves, changing our own being. We know what needs to change. The work doesn't know. The work doesn't know me. I know me. I know what needs to change. This is a wrong feeling of yourself. And finally, don't be hearers, but doers. You can't just sit here and hear this stuff every week. You can't just listen to this. You've got to do it. I give you something to do every single time I talk to you. Some of you don't even know that. Honestly, some of you don't even know that every single time I talk to you, I give you something to do. They go, you didn't give me something to do. What did you give me to do? I don't remember you giving me a task. No, unless I spell it out for you and say, okay, I want you to write this. That you consider to be a task. But you're not considering this to be a task. Look, don't just hear this. Do it. Well, what does that mean? Start to look at yourself, your feeling of yourself, and start to put that next to what the work says, the knowledge of the work, what this work says. Well, I'm not sure I trust the work yet. No, that's our point. That's our problem. We don't trust anything except ourselves. That's a wrong feeling of ourselves because that part of us that we're identified with is false. It's not real. It's a liar and it means you no good. It's harmful. You do know you have eyes in you that are very harmful. I mean, look at yourself. Look at the way you live your life. You know, there should be a rite of passage for adults. 
there should be some ceremony or something where you actually can manage yourself. Adults can't manage themselves. That's why we have laws. That's why we have police forces. That's why we have armies, because adults can't manage themselves. That's really what that means, you know. If people manage themselves, we wouldn't need all that. Observe when you're full of cares and anxieties, identified with life. Do you do that? Do you observe when you're full of cares and anxieties and you're identified with life? You do, huh? Wow. Sometimes? How often is that? Not very. Okay, well, that's good. See, when I see heads go, oh, yes, I do that, I really worry. I, I get full of cares and anxieties. <laughs> I start to go, oh, man, no, I'm not, I'm not getting this across. I'm not making my point. If these people can so easily shake their heads, oh, yes, I do that, I'm not making my point. So then I have this care. I want to make my point. No, I don't want to make you feel badly. Not that I could make you feel badly, but I can make an effort. Maybe feel a little bad. Because let's face it, people are willing to buy into feeling badly. You don't have to sell that very hard. Call somebody a name. They'll buy right into feeling badly. Unless you've got somebody who's in the work, then they'll just laugh. Yep. Other people laugh too, but for different reasons. This is a sign of your being. When you can observe, when you're full of cares and anxieties about life, identified with things in life, this is a sign of your being. This is a clue to seeing your being, what kind of a person you are, the kind of person who's filled with anxieties and cares and identified with life. Pat's example to me with James was she could see that something needed to change in her, that her what she was doing with her son was all wrong, that something in her needed to change. So she got to see her being or at least a part of her being. Very powerful idea. Very powerful in her life. She couldn't do a lot about it, but she could do something about it. See, seeing, seeing it does give you a little bit of power. The more you see it, the more power that gives you. And the more light you let in, the more that light heals you. It's, like, it's not like Pat is going to change her being, but if she keeps letting light in, if she keeps seeing it without identifying and allowing it, and not justifying it away. If she keeps doing that, she will be transformed by this work. She will be, be transformed by the light. She will be cured. She will be healed. She will stop being the kind of person that she is, the deficient kind of person that she is, and start to be a more balanced, full, properly working machine. That's pretty exciting stuff to me. I get, I get excited about that. I mean, what else is there to get excited about? The Super Bowl? Oh, boy. So I'm on a different track, okay? I'm on a different track than a lot of people in life. And that's one of the things that happens with this. Our cares and our worries appear natural and justified. They, 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 they seem right to us. Well, they're, but, that's, but they're right. I mean, how many people justify it? How many people, well, you, well, I'm, a, I'm his mother. I'm supposed to do that. No, you're his mother. And you're not supposed to do that. You're his mother, you're supposed to love him. You're his mother, you're supposed to take care of him. You're your mother, you're supposed to train him. Mother, you're not supposed to live his life for him. The kid got poison oak. There's nothing you can do about that after you've done what you can do. It needs to run its course. But what about, what, what, what about all these feelings, these sensations? What about all this anxiety? Well, what about it? You need to change that. Stop worrying about his poison oak. Start worrying about you and what's happening inside of you now. See, now the problem has shifted from that to this. Maybe the problem was always this. But I'll let you figure that out for yourself. Apply the knowledge of the work to self-observation. This forms observing I. When you apply the knowledge of the work to your self-observation, so Pat saw this better self, but she applied the knowledge of the work to it. She didn't justify it. She didn't apply the knowledge of life to it, which is, well, of course, I'm a mother. That's the way mothers are supposed to do. A good mother does that. A bad mother doesn't care. A bad mother... See, that self-justification, that kind of thing, that's all life knowledge. That kind of life knowledge, you apply that to self-observation, you're nowhere. But you apply these work, this work knowledge to self-observation, everything changes. It's like the plus sign changes to a minus sign over here, and the minus sign over here changes to a plus sign. There's a big shift that takes place. Now, we can't see the shift in outer circumstances. We can't see it right away. We aren't totally different people. <gasps> I've been born again! No, we're not like that. But what happens is a subtle shift begins to occur inside of you. And then as that shift occurs, it's like a boat that just kind of keels a little bit to one side. It's a subtle shift and things. Maybe you'll notice that the glass of water just is not sliding across the table, but you notice the glass isn't 
the water in the glass isn't level anymore. Now it's like that. It's tilted to one side. You start to notice there's something a little different. There's something a little different in the way you feel about yourself and the way you see things. This is the work having an influence on you, connecting with you. Once we have observing eye, applying the knowledge of the work to self-observation, we have something that can see from the work point of view instead of from a life point of view. This is the greatest thing in the world. This is so great. You actually can see things from a work point of view instead of from a life point of view. That begins to alter everything. The impressions that come in now come in differently. The quality of the impressions is totally different because now you're seeing from a work point of view instead of a life point of view. Instead of, oh, well, he's just, he just thinks he's somebody, blah, 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 life point of view. Oh, I wonder what it is he wants. I wonder how I could give it to him, work point of view. Huge shift. Now, not a lot may happen, but being able to have the point of view is a good starting place. We need to see a gap between ourselves and a man who lives more consciously. This needs to become very real to us. We need to see that there is this huge gap between ourselves, our level of being, and a man who lives more consciously. Well, what does that mean, a man who lives more consciously? A man who lives more consciously. Someone who notices when he's becoming identified. Someone who notices when he's falling prey to fears and anxieties. Someone who notices his imaginings. Someone who notices and becomes aware when he's justifying himself. Someone who begins to become aware when he's justifying himself and can stop. Do you know what a huge gap there is between you and a person that can do that? No. Well, some of you do. But the rest of us are kind of hazy. Well, no, oh, I'm doing that a lot more than I used to do that. Yes, but that's not what I've asked you to do. I haven't asked you to see the gap between you and you. I've asked you to see the gap between yourself and someone who is more conscious. Oh, oh. I know it's irritating to you. I know it's annoying because it really offends your vanity. It offends self-love. It offends self-love. Nobody's more conscious than I am. See, that's really what you believe. That's really what you believe. And you spend your life tearing conscious people down so that nobody can be more conscious than you. So you go around finding fault with them to find that they're not more conscious than you. You're the most conscious person. No, won't work. See the gap. If you can't see the gap, go back to the drawing board. Go to Old Navy if you can't see the gap. <laughs> <laughs> the gap is so great that if we see it, we'll feel our enormous deficiencies in our quality of being. It's like your nothingness. The Pope, they call his holiness. Yes, your holiness, his holiness. Just call me his nothingness and just say to me, yes, your nothingness. That's right. That's what I want to be reminded of. I want to be reminded of my nothingness. Not my holiness, not my wonderfulness. I want to be reminded of my nothingness. Because that will give me more than anything else. More of what I want. More of what I need. I need to realize and feel my enormous deficiencies in the quality of my being. If you can begin to see this about your being, you're already further along, <laughs> however hopeless you may feel. At first, we feel very hopeless. Because at first, the work doesn't really have a connection with us, with our being. It's just knowledge. So we start to feel very hopeless. And if we see these things, so if you're in the work, you'll feel the strength of the work around you. But if you're not in the work, that is, if, you're, if the work is not connected to your being, if it's connected just to your knowledge, then what happens is disaster. You start to observe, and, you, and it's disastrous. You start to feel despondent. You want to commit suicide. You want to get out of this. This is horrible. Then you start turning it on other people. That's because it's connected with your knowledge. It's just in your memory. It's not in your being. When it's in your being, you're connected with the strength and the power of it. It's not a problem to see your nothingness. In fact, it's exciting. It's like, oh, nothing. That's great. Who could get so excited about? I mean, look at the smile on my face. Who could get so excited about their nothingness? Anybody who understands what that really means. You can't help but be excited by it. It's exciting. Look at all of the stuff that falls away then. You know, maybe you can't. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. If you can, do it. Good. If you can't, don't worry. It'll come. False personality weakens us. It makes us brittle. It makes us easily upset. It makes us narrow. And what I find particularly interesting is it makes us mean in our understanding of ourselves and others. 
I found that people with a higher level of being, more expanded consciousness, more awake, are very generous in the way they see other people. But people who are full of false personality are very critical of the way they see other people. An interesting thing. Being critical, we think, in a worldly sense, makes us more powerful, makes us stronger. But the truth is, it weakens us. It makes us brittle. It makes us easily upset. It makes us narrow. Only these people are acceptable. And it makes us mean in our understanding of ourselves and others. Not generous at all, but mean. We must begin to isolate ourselves from the influences of life following the influences of this work. Oh, this is where we lose a lot of people. No, you're trying to take life away from me. You're trying to take these things away from me. No, I'm not trying to take anything away from you. I don't care what you do. It doesn't mean I don't care about you. It means that I understand that there's nothing I can do about what you do. Therefore, it is brainless for me to be anxious or worry about what you do. I can't afford to do that. That is not a judicious, prudent use of my energy and force to expend it on worrying and being anxious about what you're going to do. You're going to do what you're going to do. So this is the beginning of our isolation from life and following the influences of this work. The work carries different influences from those of life. The influences that life carries are entirely different than the influences that the work carries. The influences that the work conducts are so different than the influences that life conducts. They are almost exact opposites, yet they are together. It's like false personality surrounds essence. The work is not the same as life. This is such a simple thing to say. But if you really get what I'm saying, the work is not the same as life. Don't try to make it the same as life. Don't try to stick work ideas in your system of beliefs because you'll spoil the ideas. You'll spoil the work and you won't do anything for yourself. It's like taking new wine and putting it into old wineskins. The skins will burst, the wine will be lost, and the skins will be ruined. So don't do that. Life is one thing and the work is another thing. This work is real. Essence is real. It must be nourished by what is real. This work is real. Essence is real. Essence can only be fed and nourished by what is real. The false personality is nourished by life. Life conducts nourishment to the false personality. This work conducts nourishment to essence. That's how this works. Isn't it beautiful? It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so simple. It's so good. The problem is, is that false personality has taken the place of real feelings, the real feeling of ourself. So the real feeling of ourself belongs to essence, but, we're, but what has it is false personality, which is nourished by life. False personality is that group of eyes linked together by vanity. See, people get confused about personality. Not all personality is bad. False personality is what the problem is. False personality is all those eyes that are linked together by vanity and self-love. But what about those other eyes that are not linked together by vanity and self-love? No, let's save the whales. What about those eyes? Well, they don't really come from essence. Where do they come from? Well, they come from life. They come from our conditioning. But they're not connected. But they can be connected. Don't get me wrong. They can. You can connect them up with vanity. I mean, it can happen. It's just an unfortunate thing if it does, but it, but it can happen. So we have other eyes in personality. Some good, some not so good. These two must be observed. Religious eyes, good eyes to observe. Political eyes, good eyes to observe. You know, well, I was raised a uh, Republican, or I was raised a Democrat, or I was raised a, a heathen, or I was raised an atheist, or I was raised a Catholic. Well, that's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. Now observe those eyes. That's all. Just observe those eyes as part of your personality. Ospensky said, knowledge of your being, self-remembering, non-identifying, and non-considering. Those four things, knowledge of your being, self-remembering, non-identifying, and non-considering are the four supreme practices that help us to isolate ourselves from the continual impact that external life has on us and so enable us or enable something to grow in us apart from life. So let me read you his exact quote. Knowledge of your being, self-remembering, non-identifying, and non-considering are four supreme practices help isolate ourselves from continual impact of external life and so enable something to grow in us apart from life. Do you want something to grow in you apart from life so that when life is finished with you and you're at the end of it, there is something else? So do I.
I want that for you. I want that for me. So do I. I want that for as many people as want it. Do I want it for everyone? No. Only for the people who want it. Because what good is it for everyone? You give it to everyone, what do they do with it? They'll look, it's just like blood. Well, you know, if you got too much blood, sell it. You know, some people right away will sell my I'll sell it. Then there are other people who go, I could donate it. It's just the way life is. You know? So I want the people who want it, who want to do something with it, to have it. Not the people who want to sell it so that they get more from life. No, that's not what I'm interested in. And that's what we're here for. That's what this is about. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And that's what you're supposed to be doing, just in case you missed it. Be a doer, not just a hearer.